have to just believe in the the bigger goal than mm. the specifics. Business of Architecture UK, episode 57. Hello and welcome. My name is Ryan Willard and I'm the host of the Business of Architecture UK. And this week I'm speaking with Laura Cresimano of Site Lab Urban Studio, which is a business that is based in San Francisco. And she was actually visiting London and I had the good opportunity to go and meet her in the Google headquarters in St. Pancras in, in, uh, in, in center, center of town. Um, and Google is one of her clients in San Francisco. And we got the opportunity to talk about how she has grown a multidisciplinary urban design and strategic studio um, and how she's kind of been able to be involved in these sort of master planning projects where she is collaborating with a number of you know large scale architects, multi headed um, clients, and how she's able to you know pull those teams together, um, and also the just the ebbs and flows of her own business and her own design philosophy, and also the ins and outs of working with her her late partner. Evan Rose. So this is a really inspiring story. There's a lot of gold here. So sit back and enjoy Laura Cressamana. So Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great all, to be here. You're all the way from San Francisco. I am. And we're in the Google offices here in London who are one of your clients. Yes. And you're doing some work with them both in San Francisco and over here in London? We're actually, our work is all in the Bay Area with them, but uh, this has been a bit of a study trip to look at other projects, either both their own other projects and other development projects. Ah, okay. Kind of large scale, complex nature. Excellent. Well, welcome to London. Thank you. Fantastic to have you. And an absolute pleasure for me to be able to speak with you and find out a little bit more about Site Lab, which you co founded with Evan Rose in 2012? 2012, yes. Excellent. So, how did that? How did that start? And what, how would you describe what it is that you, that you do? Yes. So it started uh, because I, so I was, I'm trained as an architect, but I wasn't very good at staying in my lane. And I got into politics and I got into research and I got into strategy and I got into urban design. Um, and I was thinking about what I wanted to do next. And I happened just right place at the right time, um, right moment in my career and his to meet Evan, and we really um, instantly over coffee. By the end of coffee, we basically had just started to st- decided to start a business together. Um, and we had I after think, the first coffee. After the first coffee, yeah, I, I like it. Okay. Um, he also is was uh, someone very willing to take risks, so yeah. that was good. He was uh, good at taking that leap, and um, we both were very interested in doing work that really focused on public life and the public realm and thinking about how our cities would grow and evolve and and at the same time being quite pragmatic because we wanted to see things get built. And so I think it's a – we both occupied a certain niche between – it's not quite – it's, it's like – architecture informed, landscape architecture informs, city planning informed, urban design, bringing that together in in really urban and infill kinds of projects. Mm. And so we started, it really was a, by the end of coffee, we had said, why don't we do this thing? And where did you guys meet? At, at- in San Francisco. So he, um, we met. Well, how did you meet? We yeah. actually were introduced through a mutual client. Right, okay. Which helps the story a little bit. Um she felt like we both were kind of speaking the same language, but separately on two different projects that she had, each with, with one of us. Um, so she suggested that we meet, and, you know, we just were like, the, okay, you know, done. Um, of course, you know, months, six months about of conversations to make sure and to get on the same page and see if this thing could have legs. He was based, he had been in the Bay Area, but at the time he was based in New York. And so there was a very good matchup for me of I didn't have the long resume that he had. He was 10 years ahead of me in his career. Um, but I had local connections. I had the hustle. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were very aligned. And he was in New York trying to do Bay Area work from New York. I did not have a team. So we decided this is a, this is 
this could work. Um, so were you both working in solo operations at that I point? I was at a firm. You, you I a was firm. at Gensler at the time. Okay. Um, and he was solo operation. And so, and I had, I basically was, had decided to leave um, and was looking for what my next thing was and trying to sort out. I knew it, I knew I wanted it to be more truly urban um, focused, but I was still trying to figure out, I was like, maybe I'll teach. Maybe it's a strategy IDEO type thing. It was really, Mm. um, and then it just, it kind of locked in and we had the opportunity because of this mutual client who was at the next phase of a project that we matched up with very well once we were put together. Um, right, so okay. she, once we said we were going to do it, we pitched her and we managed to get that contract. And so that was what we opened our doors with. And that, that Pier 70? That was actually the 5M project. The 5M, so it's right. the same client as the Pier 70 project. It's 5M, which is in San Francisco, in South of Market area, uh, where the Chronicle, the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper is. And it's about four and a half acres that is the Chronicle newspaper and mostly service parking that's in a pretty core area. Mm-hmm. And so it's a mixed use uh, urban complex, you know, you name it, historic community, uh, all the issues, wind. Um, and so we started on that, but very quickly, so Evan had been working on Pier 70, so very quickly Pier 70 ended up uh, coming into Site Lab as well. Um, and that, so those two projects were our, like, you know, so those bread are, and butter for yeah, so those, first couple of years. Th- those are quite substantial they are. projects to be kicking off a practice are, with. What with w- two people. Yeah. Three people. Yeah. So, so Tell me a little bit about how you guys managed to put a team together around yes. that, what that was like. Well, for both projects and really for the way we work, we're small. And our goal is not to become a big firm. And really it's to be able to do the kind of strategic, nimble work that we do. Um, and also to find opportunities of collaboration with other designers and thinkers. Um, because I think the best places are made from many minds and many voices and many hands. Mm. Um, And I think that's a better offering to a client, too, personally. Of course, some clients like a go to a one-stop shop. You could get it all, and there's an efficiency and a value to that. Uh, So for those projects, both of them had collaborators. So 5M, we ended up bringing in uh, KPF on the architecture, and then there was a local uh, landscape architect, Tom Leader Studio, on Pier 70, uh, we worked with the client was Forest City, and we worked with them through a selection process, and they brought in field operations on landscape, uh, Grimshaw Architects on the commercial architecture, and David Baker Architects, which is a local Bay Area residential architect. And so we took the role of the overall master planning, but also orchestrating the process and being a little bit of a design manager um, to bring together a way that all those different thinkers could design into one whole. Yeah. So it's kind of managing a large scale collaboration yes. with some pretty yes. serious, well developed practices, yes. international practices. Yes. That, so what how? Um what were the kind of obstacles that you well, faced in I that? I think one obstacle is that when you're doing urban design and master planning, it's a different ball game than doing a building, doing right. architecture and architectural uh, concept. So it's much more scenario based. It's much more testing kind of bookends of a situation, thinking through worst case scenarios, because you can't control, you don't get to control the final outcome mm. in that say it's, I mean, both those projects were multi-year projects to get through, to get that approved so that they could start building. And ideally multiple people are designing the final buildings. If there are 10 buildings in a project, it shouldn't be all the same architect. And so I think one of the struggles for us, and and certain architects are better at it than others, is for architects, working with an architect to get them to scenario play versus make the proposal. Um, and so there was definitely, you know, when we joked a lot, at, I remember we're joking a lot with the field operations about it because it was just like they really wanted to just go ahead and do it. Mm. And it wasn't, it was actually testing program scale, testing different arrangements, coming up with a core concept that could guide even if some things changed about the design. So that I think has always, is always struggle because it's just inherently a different nature. Yeah. Um, and how, how yeah. do you, how do you keep the relationship with those individual architects? Is it a process? Cause I've, I used to, I used to work for Grimshaw actually mm. and, and done, worked on, 
buildings within master plans. Mm -hmm. And often it's been quite an interesting relationship to what we have as you know a delivery architect working yes. on a singular building yes. and then the lack of relationship in many cases with the architects who were generating the master plan. So how, how mm. did you kind of maintain those relationships or how did you? Well, I think, I mean, one is it's just, it's, it's like personal investment, right? I yeah. think all, all collaborations, whether it's your client or a uh, community member or city official or uh, a design collaborator, it's really a kind of personal relationship. So I think mm. the more you actually get face to face time and the more you get to roll up your sleeves and roll out the trace together, the better those have gone. Um, and keeping people in the loop, right? People, yeah. we as designers want to know, we want to know everything. We want to know how it turned out. Uh, <laughs> I think we're always really hungry for feedback, you know, cause there's like, it's our egos in it. So, um, I think there are a lot of times we play the conduit cause a client is, keeps moving. They're kind of moving on mm. and they don't necessarily always think to close the loop. So we did that a lot. Um, and then, you know, some of those have gone on. To design buildings, but it's a lot of new people also that are coming into the design the buildings. Um, and I think a lot of it is just respect, you know, that we all are bringing value and that isn't. So you have to kind of let go a little bit, actually. Like, yes. Yeah. And urban design is letting go. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why to be an architect working on an urban design project to on a master planning project and not necessarily the building proposal. I think that's where that's the hard part, right? Because it's right. somewhere between does being the the designer and letting go right yeah. and ours is very much what we control is process what we can control our principles and objectives or the big idea or s organizing devices mm. frameworks platforms those are the things we think in scenarios so that we're still very much and we you know graphics we care a lot about how things present how they communicate and there's like labor in you know those details but all of our projects change a million times from when we start them to the end. And we have, you have to just believe in the, the bigger goal than mm. the specifics. So the end, the end vision yes. kind of thing. Um, so when you started, it was, yes. it was you and Evan, mm -hmm. and then you were working on pier 17 mm -hmm. and, and 5M. How quickly did the, the, did the business scale? What kind of size are you at the moment? Um, we're almost 15. I think we're 14 right now. Yeah. Um, it has scaled fairly regularly and incrementally. So we started with one, you know, we kind of brought someone in from almost day one. And then the second person was probably a, f that was a few months later. And it, it was, um, we're very hands on it and very much like whoever needs to do the doing does it. And it isn't like, um, it's not an assembly line, right? And everybody's pull up your bootstraps. And I think at the end of the day, even in large firms, the teams aren't necessarily that large. I think yeah. if you're doing a construction, if you're in like construction documents, you're going to a different proposition. But in those kind of conceptual design, so it's like a team of three to five or three to six, that's no different than us. We just don't have as many... We don't do as many different things at the same time. It's, it's really interesting you say that, actually, because we forget sometimes that lots of these large practices, the way they actually operate is more akin to kind of a cellular right. structure yep. filled with lots of little practices exactly. under one. They spend a lot of time breaking large firms are, you know, what's the they have multiple studios and practice areas. And then within those, there are groupings. So that's we're like one of those most mm. urban design practices. I think we're unique in being a standalone that is what we do in urban design. Don't. We don't follow, we don't, we don't do implementation and we're not, most are part of a larger firm, part of an architecture firm. For some, it's a loss leader, mm. right? For some, it's a practice um, or both. So, but I don't know that we're fundamentally different in that because at the end of the day, it's the people, right? Yeah. So for a client or for a project, it's who are, who's the person that is going to work on it every day or mm. take that phone call or present that to and, the community. And, and how have you cultivated your your team? How have you put mm. together, how have, mm -hmm. you, how have you hired people, particularly in that early yes. phase where you, you know, was it, was it contacts that you already knew or? Much was through contacts. A few people and two that are, actually more than two that are, that are still with us came through Evan, were Evan's students. Right. Um, he taught at Columbia and then Penn. Uh, in the grad school. So those, we have great people that came through that. And I think they, 
it was also what attracted, you know, people that were attracted to him as a professor were attracted to us as a practice. Um, now it's, it's a mix. A lot is still through word of mouth, but the word of mouth comes often through the team. So it's friends of theirs or friends of friends of theirs or, you know, their professor right. uh, knew someone. So it's a little bit like that. It is one of probably the hardest things for our office is hiring mm. and finding the right people. When you're small, the culture fit is really important. We have a very, very collaborative, collegial, smart, talented team that actually all wants to grow. And it's not about, it's not zero sum gain. Um, and so that's like, I'm very aware of keeping whatever that, whatever has created that mix, keeping that going. Yeah. Um, and our team are very, I would say cross disciplinary, but really just coming from multiple perspectives. So we have people from around the world. We have people who degree is in landscape architecture or architecture or city planning. Um, and so everyone, they have some, some depth in some aspect of things. But they're very much crossover people, and they are, that's their that drives them, right? So that curiosity and wanting to connect the dots across things. Um, so it is what we found is it's been hard to hire kind of the more senior. So right. we have a lot of people kind of earlier on in school because that's a that's kind of the nature a little bit of school, and then we can train them into having the expertise across. And then I think they're particular senior people that we have that that's their mindset. But it's hard to take someone out of, they've gone deep, you know, at that point that they're 15 years into their career, they're pra yeah. a practicing architect and that is a, a leap, you know. So that's, that is, that has been one of the, that's been a tricky. And so do you prefer piece. then to, to hire younger staff rather than? It's what has ended up happening. Mm. I, you know, I think, and what is good is that we're growing that team. And so, you know, they're now that we're, it's almost seven years in practice and we have people who have been with us for five years of that. So they're growing into that middle level. So it does seem to be, it, it's not that it's actually our preference if we found the right people that we're doing that, but it, it just is, I think it's harder because I think it's harder to do it, right? Yeah. The, they, the world wants people to go into tracks. You yeah, know? exactly. And and so how have you kind of fed the team then in mm. terms of work? How have you gone about – so you had those two projects. Were they kind of self-generating projects in terms of they just kept on leading to more work? Or have you had – have you implemented specific marketing strategies and how do you negotiate with clients? Yep. And um, Marketing is not my favorite. I think yep. probably most, most designers would say that. Um, we were very lucky to have those two projects and those were very stable for us for a couple of years. And then we, but we were very aware that all our eggs were one, in one basket and th things happen. Project could get, you know, pull the plug for some reason that has nothing to do with anyone on the ground. Mm. Um, so we, but at the same time, most of our work has been generated through relationships. So it's like you have a relationship with a client and then they tell, especially if it's a national company, national developer, they tell their New York office or their New York office sees the project and wants to talk. And so some spin off from that or our experience has also been our model is we aren't, our work is really about what, what helps us grow, you know, healthy, vital, equitable cities. And so if that, is a master plan, if that is a public space plan, if that is a, like a graphic, we've done these like manual toolkits, if that is a, you know, it, what form it takes doesn't totally matter to me. I'm more interested in the questions it's asking and the mm -hmm. way it's contributing. And what happens is clients who we're very, we build a strong relationship with and they see the value in the process that we're, and the way we're thinking, bring us into multiple different things that aren't necessarily the original thing that we pitched for. So, oh, you've never done an interpretive signage plan? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Do that, please. You know? And so that's also how we proliferate our work. Um, but we did just start to, we actually hooked in with landscape architects into a number of public realm kinds of projects, and that was the first bridge. Um, and then I think that the power of Pier 70 and 5M gave us, a reputation. So it's really, you know, reputation and relationships, right? Mm. Um, 
to then get people, some coming because they knew we had managed this complex project. They knew we had helped carry through this team um, to a design that everyone, you know, is quite excited about. Um, and some came because they thought, well, I have a sticky entitlement and you seem to have navigated the community or the politics. Can you do that over here? Right. right so okay. it was, became an art of also choosing, like, what is the thing we want to reinforce? Right. So there were certain elements of those projects yes. that clients were kind of like, ah, okay, uh -huh. you've managed yes. to get us yes. the planning permissions or whatever yes. it was on that site. That was, it was really interesting well, how you were saying that some of your clients end up bringing you on them to other things where you might not have necessarily had the experience mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. because they were kind of being, you were almost educating them in a way. How, what is the, what, what is the sort of exact process that you go through in terms of not indoctrinating, that's not the right mm -hmm. word, but, <laughs> but, but um, presenting particular yes. architectural and urban mm -hmm. ideas to a client that's perhaps not, you know, how, how do you, how do you get yeah. them interested? Well, I think in all of our work, and it's something I came out of school thinking that it was really important. I think that in some cases, architecture doesn't communicate as well as it could. Yes. Right? So there's a, we get schooled in a certain, a love of something that is very obtuse to everybody else. And I thought that, that there's such a power in design, it should be more transparent and more accessible. And if we could bring more people into the process by being clear with them, better decisions could be made. More people would value um, the place you're creating. And I think that goes for whether it's a community member or a city planner or your client. Uh, so we're very, um, we all of our work, we really unpack the details or the steps of what we're doing or the logic or the inputs into very clear a uh, clear steps. So I think in certain ways, what people see us doing are they see us working through problems and taking them on the journey through the problem. Mm. And in that case, then they can make better decisions because we've now armed them with the tools or armed them with the trade offs. And so I do think of part of our practice is really creating frameworks for decision making. And when you do that, it's not whether the thing is. Um, office buildings or parks or all of the above, it doesn't, I think they're, they're, they're looking for our process and our thinking and what we'll bring to it. Got it. Yeah. So it's like a kind of almost like a, a scientific procedure that's very clear and can be kind of reviewed and analyzed and you're able to present that to. Uh, yeah, a little bit. I think that the balance or what we strive for is that we could bring together that kind of either research or analytical lens with the inspirational lens. Yeah. Because if it's just analysis. analysis, I don't think, you know, there's no magic, right? And it's like we all want to be excited <laughs> about places or what we might create. And so it's really how we bring those together. And some of them are in the visuals. Some of them are in the, the design or the party. Mm -hmm. Some of them are in the narrative, right? It's like bringing people on a story so that – it really, it makes sense, but also it resonates in right. some way. So that's that's really our practice is how do we bring those two together to have a practice that's about experience of place, right? Making a place for, for more and better experiences. So, so who are your clients? How would you describe they Do they tend to be sort of large, multi-headed developer type clients? Or, I mean, obviously you've got yeah. to deal with local communities yes. and, the, yes. you know, the, in the world of urbanism, there's, it becomes more complex because you really are yes. accountable to the city. Yes. Our, the clients that hire us are a mix of private developers that are usually of scale, national or international, um, who value something about the complexity and um, importance of creating place mm -hmm. versus um, you know, certainly, and there's merit, you know, you have, it's all roles that versus it being a more financially, you know, uh, transactionally driven. We are also, so I would say it's maybe 60% that, and then the other 40 is a mix of cities. So a city planning department or, um, you know, right now we're working for San Francisco, like MTA, like the transit 
group on looking at their, they own a lot of property, right? What, yeah. How can they do, what can they do with it? So cities and counties and then some like community groups and nonprofits. Um, but who we work for isn't always the same, right? And I'm a real believer. I think we have chosen or I've chosen with Site Lab that we're working inside the system, right? So I think you can move the needle from inside the system. I think there are people that value, and many of the people who have gone into development or into city planning are doing it because they want to make great whole cities, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can give them a path to do that, that they could, that makes sense economically and could be um, embraced by a community, right? So I believe in a kind of shared value model or in we think about threading the needle a lot, that if we can get underneath um, pe different positions into the interests, right? So maybe if we could get underneath why you want what you want and why they want what they want, there's probably a solution. Mm. And that's really where we think our work is. And we were, you know, kind of naively optimistic or idealistic um, and willfully so that we could, that that is a path. Um, it works most of the time. <laughs> Got it. Great. And so, and so, tell me a little bit about your relationship with Evan. What mm -hmm. made that mm -hmm. a successful mm -hmm. partnership? Um, well, he was an amazing person. So, um, and so, Evan. So, we co-founded Say Lab with Evan in 2012, um, and he, at the time that we started, was sick. So, he had been diagnosed with cancer with a rare form of sarcoma in maybe 2008, um, outlived every diagnosis he got um, in a pretty incredible, like very wholehearted, like living life kind of way. Um, and and he passed away in 2015. So we were in business for three years uh, before he passed away. I think it's a mix of that we just were on the same wavelength. So we really felt like in many ways we had tracked in the same but slightly eccentric track through our careers. Um, so that there was that. So it was just, it clicked right away. Mm. I think that we were complementary in our, um, we didn't agree on everything, but we could argue it into a third place um, that we both were excited about. And truthfully, because he was sick, it made for, I think, very quickly a different relationship because it made for a certain kind of honesty and a certain um, prioritization of like what matters yeah. very quickly because I didn't know if it was going to be one year or two years or three years or five, right? Mm. And But I knew it wasn't going to be 10. Yeah. Um, so I think that we it created a trust that is takes a lot longer when there aren't those kinds of forces. And how, what was it like, obviously, after he, he passed, like that must have been, and I can't imagine what that would have been like for you uh, and, the rest of the, and the rest of the team. How did you, like, how did you evolve or move along? How, um, have, you, how have you kind of been? I mean, there was a period of, I, even though I knew it was coming, it's still, sh like, it's still shocking. So I do think there was, there's, some, there's a foggy phase in there. Um, I really didn't know what was going to happen in certain ways because he had been sick, because it didn't come out of nowhere. Starting the business, it was like, you know, riding a bike without any training wheels. Um, and so I learned, I had a very steep learning curve and I was like on, you know, I kind of learned on the job in ways and he was able to be there and then he wasn't there and then he was there again. So there are certain ways that may or may not have been visible to the outside that I got trained up, yeah. you know, um, in a really like really beautiful and meaningful way that, with, that I feel really um, grateful that I got that opportunity to learn and work with him. And then when he died, it was it was a very surreal time because I really did not know would their clients walk away, mm. like wh who would stay. Um, these are pretty big projects, you know. Um, we were a small office. We were maybe four or five at the time. So I really, I didn't know what was going to happen. And it, and you know, a lot of people kind of, things were revealed, you know, in those moments. And um, and people banded together. And, and in a certain way, I think I probably handled it by just kind of putting my head down and just moving forward. Um, and 
really taking cues from Evan was very, as I mentioned, he, he wasn't afraid to leap. He was very interested in, um, questioning what could be, you know, what if very optimistic. And, um, and so I kept on, I think, reminding myself of that and, and just kind of one foot in front of the other. Mm. And look, and I really feel like I looked up like a year later. Um, and I was like, Oh, we're still here. (laughs) This thing is, this thing seems to be growing. Um, and I still feel that way. You know, it's like almost four years later since, since he died. And it's like, wow, this, you know, I guess it worked. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but it is, I feel it's also, um, for me, it's an honor that I get to be part of continuing his legacy. Right. And that's a, it's a certain driver. And it is for a lot of people in the office, the ones, even the ones that didn't know him, like always mm. want to hear about it, um, which is, I think really, it's, that's meaningful for us. And so what's next? What's next? And how, um, how are you, how are oof. you growing? What's the, what's, what's the next big challenge that you want to take oh, on? Or that you're... Um, we are, we are busy. Um, we are here in the Google office. Google is one of our clients. I didn't mention that. Developers, nonprofits and cities, and then now tech clients are building cities. Um, so that's a fascinating uh, process. It's really exciting to be a part of it. And it kind of stretches, I think, all of us in all ways. Uh, so that, you know, we're working where Google has its headquarters in Mountain View on the potential of building 6,000 units of housing, as well as all, everything else, you wow. know, 35 acres of public space and trails and, um, as of course, as well as office uh, mm. and retail. So um, for me, it's, I don't have a, this is, um, I'm very opportunistic and less like this is my five-year target. I'm not a five-year plan person to save my life. Um, but I'm very interested in what are the what are the difficult questions that are facing cities and how can we be a part of that? And so mm. some of that means pro bono work. You know, we've done a lot of work with Lava May, which is an incredible um, group that does mobile hygiene. So basically they outfitted originally old buses with showers and wow. for, for people suffering from homelessness. Um, and then it's grown from showers to being these pop-up care villages where they bring together um, services and food and music and all kinds of things. So whether it's that, which is like very impermanent and our contribution it, to it is a very like, in my eyes, light touch thing for yeah. them. I think um, it's a service they don't have. But so partly it's just to continue doing that work and doing interesting work that's asking hard questions and to avoid being in a place where we're um, on any kind of autopilot. Like that's, I'm, I'm averse to boredom, boredom. So, um, and I think growing to the sense of being able to do that work and potentially start to do it, we are predominantly working in the Bay Area. We've dabbled a little bit on the East Coast of the U.S. Um, we've done some workshops with some work in London, um, but I would like to, you know, take it beyond, to, you know, expand us mm. geographically where we're working more and expand the team so that they can take on more. Um, themselves. Brilliant. And I was going to ask you as well, because you've, you've had quite a sort of prestigious education, if you like. You've, mm-hmm. been, to, you've been, you trained at Yale and at the uh, Harvard Design School. Um, and also Evan as well had strong links mm-hmm. with, with academia. Mm-hmm. How does your relationship with education feed in? Well, you spoke a little bit about how yeah. you kind of feed in with, you know, in terms of employment. Yep. But what are your sort of thoughts, like having a from academia and the yes. kind of the, the sort of disjunct, if you like, between that yes. and business. Yes. Um, I, so I originally thought I was going to be an academic when I was in grad school. I went to grad school because I thought I was going to be an architectural professor, historian. And then after, you know, four years at the Harvard Design School in architecture and the prospect of that, the, that didn't count at all towards my PhD. <laughs> I rethought that a little <laughs> bit, um, but but I am I'm very fascinated by how we unpack things and think about issues, and at the same time, I very much want them to be applied to the real world. Mm. And so I did also feel like I needed to 
you know, connect with people and be delivering something to people. I would love to end up finding a path similar to Evan to be part of, you know, a university at some point. Um, I think that, you know, and it's different schools are different and I don't have my fingers on the pulse of it right now, but my education was very formal. And I found the ways to kind of counter that by going outside of the track that I was, you know, mm. the architectural studios. And I found the professors, the ones that truthfully were maybe uh, the anomalies in my um, program. Or I took classes that were th more through the urban design or I ran, I mean, I ran women in design, which is a women's group at Harvard, which has gone on. I mean, before me did great things and after me did great things. Um, they were, you know, I think gained quite a reputation for petitioning for Denise Scott Brown to be, you know, acknowledged. Yeah. acknowledged. So that was actually an incredible part of my education was being part of leading that group and organizing at the school and thinking about the way we wanted to be represented and led. And actually through it, we ran a series of, we hosted conversations that were not necessarily about women, but just an opportunity to have great designers talk to us in informal settings versus at the front of a lecture hall, which mm. wasn't on offer. Um, so I think that it's, to me, it was like in the spaces in between that I, in my education, I got a lot of the things that I, that actually guide my practice. Um, I, now that I run a business, um, and even then felt that there was a tendency, at least within the programs I was in, to approach architecture in a very, uh, kind of the the noble the noble profession um, this idea of the noble profession and that we shouldn't think about money right mm. and you know it's fantastic if you are a person that doesn't need to think about money but I think that if we are running a business that's you know it seems to be avoiding our responsibilities it particularly to our employees right um, and I think that is part of what devalues architecture in in like the kind of economic world often yeah. so I, that's very important to me to not think about it that way that that money is not a bad thing mm. um but thinking about how to be smart about it is like actually being like wouldn't i don't know i would think your client would want <laughs> you to be you know strategic in in how you run your business if you're kind of doing major things on their behalf so i do think it, the education of architecture i think there's that side of it that it it, it, it lacks that sometimes. I also think there's, you know, and I've talked about this in the past, to me, having gone down the path I went, which is studies in architecture, trained as an architect, could have become a licensed architect, but didn't, found myself kind of moving towards acad academia at first and then urban design and seeing the potential that I have. I am more successful than I think I, I'm definitely more successful than I would have been had I stayed in a firm. And I'm, I distinguish myself more from other businesses by being in the niche, I think, and in the approaching it the way I approach it. Um, and I think that there should be more room for that because mm -hmm. I got that in part from my architectural education, even if I didn't go on to become a classical architect. Yeah. And I think that the way that the degree programs often and then the licensing, I think there it just seems overly narrow to me. I think you have to have that for someone who is going to build a building, but there should be, a, I think architecture is so much more than that. Yeah, I, I, I would totally agree with you. And I, I think architecture, the, you know, the, the discipline of architectural thinking and creative synthesis and the sort of way that we're able to connect across disciplines and fields mm -hmm. actually is such a powerful entrepreneurial tool in itself that can be applied to so many different disciplines. I mean, it's interesting that we're here at Google because mm -hmm. You know, the way that architects think about organizing space and information is so relevant to so many of these mm -hmm. large tech companies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are certainly also, you know, you know, there's a lot of conversation about your return on investment and your education. Architecture mm -hmm. is not a cheap education to go mm -hmm. through. And if you are going to be funneled down to the, you know, being a practicing architect who builds buildings, it's most likely that you're not going to get paid or remunerated that well unless you start your business and run that business mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. But the education itself has value in it that can be unlocked by crossing out and not being so rigidly right. stuck on that path. Right. And I do reflect on my classmates and there are now fashion designers with their own mm. 
lines. There are jewelry designers. There are, I mean, there's, they, it definitely has proliferated in many different directions. And there are also leaders of, you know, people who have made partner in large, you know, well-established practices of people who have gone out on their own. So that it, I think it does happen, but it doesn't, I think we could take advantage of that more and, and our educational programs could take, could think about that more yes. explicitly. I totally agree. And I think, you know, one of my professors talked about, um, that for architects, one of the things we learn is to really is the idea of the sketch. And the sketch, or like a concept model, manages to hold a ton of information and precision while being still somewhat abstract. And it, it has this um, balance, right, with it doesn't try to figure out more than it needs to figure out to convey an idea. And I think that's so fascinating and so powerful in, if you think about entrepreneurial things or strategic thinking or just solving, you know, that that ability to kind of move quickly, kind of essentialize ideas um, that ho could hold, could have specificity down the road. But um, that's not, I don't know many other educations that, yeah. that teach you that. I love that. That's a perfect place to end. Thank you so Thank much. You. I really enjoyed this conversation. I did as well. Thank Brilliant. you. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.